as is so often the case in the springtime, winter decided it wasn't ready to give up the ghosts yet and made a sudden return, so no fishing for me this week. But I did think, hey, this is the perfect time to just go ahead and talk about the 270 Winchester and get that over with. And I say get it over with because truthfully, I've been dreading talking about this cartridge. I mean, this is a cartridge that everybody either absolutely loves it or they absolutely hate it. And they just ain't much in between on this cartridge. So no matter what I say, I'm going to upset somebody. But I might be the best person to talk about this cartridge because at one time I was one of the ones that absolutely hated it. And when I say I hated a 270, you could have offered me a brand new rifle of my choice and a lifetime supply of ammunition with the only condition being it had to be chambered in 270. And I'd have politely said, no, thank you. You can keep it. <laughs> That was my opinion of a 270 for a lot of years. But since then, I've learned a lot about cartridges, bullets, shot placement, and all that good stuff. And now I am a big fan of the 270. I think it's one of the greatest cartridges ever devised for hunting. But it took me a long time to get to this place. So, yeah, I might be the person to talk about 270. But before we get too deep into this, I want to share something with y'all that I think is going to help clear up a lot of the mysteries and issues surrounding the 270 cartridge. I've talked about bullets in depth before. Matter of fact, I might have even been a little overkill on it. But <laughs> you really need to understand bullets impact and what's going on in order to understand the 270. So real quick, bullets 101 and what's happening for hunting bullets. So this is not your full metal jackets. This is not your, you know, varmint, frangible target bullets. This is not African big game stuff. This is just your normal, medium, large game bullets. You got three types of bullets. You got soft bullets, tough bullets, and then you got nozzle partitions. That's your three types. Okay, it's soft bullets. This is a boat tail soft point. All right, boat tails are designed for long range shooting. They have a high ballistic coefficient. That's the reason for the boat tail. All right, so these are made for reaching way out there. Well, when you reach way out there, you need a soft bullet because the bullet has lost its velocity by the time you get way out there. It's slowed way down you need a soft bullet that's going to perform at low velocities. In other words, it needs to be soft so that it can mushroom. If the bullet's too tough, it's just going to go straight through a deer. It's not going to expand. It's not going to do any damage to speak of. And that's what we call penciling. Okay, then you've got your just standard flat base hunting bullet. These tend to be much tougher. They're designed for impacts at closer ranges. So at closer ranges, if you have a bullet traveling at high velocities and then you have an impact, you need a tough bullet so that it stays together and just doesn't explode. And that's what the ammo manufacturers are constantly trying to balance. And it's a tough job. I mean, it's, you know, in the case of the 270, from you know, 3,100 plus feet per second to you know, 2,000 feet per second way out there at distance, that's a huge range in velocity. So you gotta have a bullet soft enough to expand at low velocities way out there, but tough enough so that it's not gonna you know, just blow up at close ranges. And during the 90s when you had the introduction of the polymer tip bullets, those were designed for rapid expansion a lot of those bullets expanded too rapidly and they would blow up on deer, on the shoulders. And I have no doubt they blew up on even larger game. Manufacturers, they made the bullets a little tougher. You know, they had to work the bugs out. It was new technology. 
The downside is though, if they got it too tough, then all of a sudden you're back to penciling a deer because it's too tough and it didn't expand. When you start getting into high velocities, that's when you're subject to start running into both problems. All right, a, a bullet at a, an extremely high velocity, especially a smaller bullet, it can go straight through a deer just like that and not do anything, or it can just completely blow apart. The larger the bullet, the more mass you have with the bullet, the more predictable its expansion is going to be. Plus, the, you know, if you've got lower velocities, the expansion is going to be more predictable. I mean, you get 270, you're getting extreme here. Nozzler partitions. Okay, these are constructed differently than almost every other bullet out there. These actually have a base with copper going through the middle of the bullet, so it's not a just solid lead core. Right, so the front section of the bullet is separate and it's a very soft frontal section, but then you've got a really tough base. So if the front section just completely disintegrates, the base is gonna stay intact and it's gonna continue to penetrate, so you're gonna get good penetration no matter what. And with the frontal section being so soft, you know, even at low velocities, you're still going to get great results. The downside to the nozzler partitions is they're just expensive. I mean, these bullets are pricey. I would have sectioned this one for y'all, but these cost too much to be cutting up. And the standard bullets have worked for you know, decades on there and still do. You, you know, what you choose is entirely up to you on bullets. You can make any of them work. You just need to understand what's going on with them in order for them to work. And then you get into, okay, where are you impacting on the deer? Are you impacting in the shoulder where you're hitting something solid? Are you shooting behind the shoulder where there's not much solid there, you know, and you're just doing a straight long shot? Well, if you've got a tough bullet that doesn't easily expand, you shoot behind the shoulder where there's nothing solid, the bullet's going to go straight through. You're going to pencil the deer. If you've got a really soft bullet that just rapidly expands and all of a sudden it's extremely high velocities and you hit a solid shoulder where you got, you know, muscle, bone, and everything else, that's when you're subject to have the bullets blow up. And then once a bullet blows up, if it blows up inside the chest cavity, inside the bowler room, where the vitals are, it can do a tremendous amount of damage and, and drop an animal like that. But you're not going to get an exit wound. If it blows up before it reaches, you know, the internal organs, you're in trouble because when it blows up and that bullet fragments and goes to pieces, all of a sudden it just lost its mass, you're not going to get any penetration after that. Okay. Now, let's talk about what ammo manufacturers did over the years to the 270. And this is why I say this is stuff you need to understand. And this stuff's complicated. All right. I mean, once you start increasing velocity, things start getting complicated. To the point that even the man ammo manufacturers messed this up, so let's talk about what they did. Most pre-9-11 ammunition, so ammunition produced before September 11, 2001, most pre-9-11 ammunition produced very poor performance on game. The combination of low muzzle velocities, non-aerodynamic bullet designs, and the trend towards 22-inch barrels all took a toll on performance. At close ranges, this ammunition performed adequately, but at ranges beyond 100 yards, kills could be very slow. At 200 yards, lean-bodied animals would often show no sign of a bullet strike whatsoever and escape to cover. Many hunters would have been fooled by what seemed like a complete miss when using this ammunition of the past. What I just read was an excerpt from an article at ballisticstudies.com. And I didn't get their permission, so don't tell them about that. 
If they want me to remove it, I'll be more than happy to. <laughs> All right, that site though, and I'm going to leave a link below to the entire article in the description section. YouTube frowns upon such links, but they don't sell any products, so we, we should be okay. They just have a lot of really great information. And for anybody interested in, you know, a particular cartridge, bullet, factory ammo, hand load, whatever, it's a great resource. You need to go check it out. And I have no affiliation with them whatsoever. It's just good information. And over the years, I've read a lot of stuff about 270 Winchester. And most of the articles I read, basically, they were just telling you, hey, you know, they managed to capture lightning in the chamber of a bolt action rifle with 270 Winchester. Greatest thing ever. None of those articles fit my actual on the ground observations. My actual on the ground observations were complete opposite. All right. And that's why I have a an extremely large mistrust of any print media out there. All right. And most of the internet. And that's why I recommend ballisticstudies.com. That's the first time I'd ever read anything on the 270 Winchester that, that matched my own personal observations. Okay. On the opposite extreme, at Jack O'Connor, author of this book here, The Hunting Rifle, huge proponent of the 270. He's famous for, you know, he loved 270 and respected by many people. Okay, so what happened between Jack O'Connor and BallisticStudies.com? Right, what happened to the 270? Was he lying or are they lying? Well, what happened was the, the ammo manufacturers didn't know what they were doing or maybe they knew what they were doing and some of them were intentionally trying to sabotage 270. I can't tell you what, you know. just. This is something you don't hear about other than the article I read here. Basically, when 270 came out, and it came out in 1925, Winchester came out with a brand new rifle, the Model 54 bolt-action rifle, the predecessor to the Model 70, and it, it was only offered initially in two chamberings, 30-06, 270. And Jack O'Connor, he bought his first 270 in Model 54 in 1925, the year it was introduced, the rifle and the cartridge. All right, well, when, it, when Winchester introduced the 270 cartridge, it only came with one loading, 130 grain bullet, and it's traveling 3,160 feet per second. And that 3160 might be a little optimistic, but independent sources from the time, so yeah, it was pretty much what it was doing. Well, people got to complaining about it doing too much damage to me. I mean, it was doing some serious damage. And Jack O'Connor even referenced that in his book here, The Hunting Rifle. As a matter of fact, no matter what I read, I, I see echoes of his writing everywhere, even on the Ballistic Studies article here. All right, so Winchester introduced 150 grain loading to slow it down. So that people didn't get all the damage. All right, well, over the years, other manufacturers released cartridges and so forth. And, well, apparently they slowed theirs down too and kept slowing them down. They reduced the powder charges. All right, so we get to the 1980s, 1990s. The average muzzle velocity for 130 grain 270 was 2,850 feet per second. The only one left that, that had a loading over 3,000 feet per second for a 130 grain bullet was Winchester. Right. I don't have the manufacturer's ammo catalogs for all the various years, for all the various manufacturers, so I can't tell you who did what when. It's just that what I've pieced together from all the various sources I've read. You've got that average of 2,850 feet per second, 80s, 90s, through that period. 
and you've got bullets that I guarantee you that they didn't change their bullet designs. I guarantee you when they slowed down their bullets, they stayed with a really tough bullet designed for those impacts, those high velocities. And Jack O'Connor himself, he mentioned that the 130 grain bullet that Winchester offered to 270M was a tough bullet. It had to be to handle those impact velocities. You get into the 80s and 90s, that they're still running that same tough bullet because I can't imagine them doing a whole lot of research during that time to make sure they got something right because they were bad about not getting stuff right a lot. Yeah, we're going to talk about Sub Mauser and 257 Roberts later on. But <laughs> still mad at them over those cartridges. But All right, so they're still running a really tough bullet, but now all of a sudden it's a lot lower velocities. You're penciling deer. We had a lot of that going on in the 90s. And that's what was referenced on ballisticstudies.com. I can read the whole article. Okay, on the, during that same time, keep this in mind too, we had the introduction of polymer tip bullets during the 90s. A polymer tip bullet, all that is is a hollow point with polymer stuck in the tip just to increase the aerodynamics of it. It's made for rapid expansion. All right, what a, a lot of those expanded just a little too rapidly back in the 90s when they first came out. <laughs> So you shoot one deer, bam, it just drops in its tracks, you know, extensive damage. You shoot the next deer and it's, it's off to the races because that bullet just blew up on its shoulder. And so we had a lot of stuff going on then with 270 in particular. And the 270 being such a high velocity and such a small bullet, it was, you know, that's where you were going to see you know, bad decisions from the ammo manufacturer, from the bullet designer. That If they didn't get something right, it was going to show up on a small bullet traveling at high velocity. Right. So that's why we saw so many problems with the 270 back then. But it didn't have anything to do with the 270. It was the ammo manufacturers and bullet manufacturers and the stuff they were putting out. And I'm going to blame more than anything the writers back at the time. I don't know if they were just there trying to sell ammo, bullets, or whatever, but um, we're just going to say they did a really poor job, and this is stuff we had to figure out on, their, on our own. And we didn't have the internet then. So, again, this is, I have a huge mistrust of media, anything to gun hunting related. I don't trust it. And it comes from that time period. Okay, we also have the issue of bullet placement on animals. And I talked extensively about this in the 243 video, but basically, shoot behind the shoulder, you're in soft tissue, shoot in the shoulder, you're in hard tissue. Well, that's important stuff. And, and Jack O'Connor, in this book here, he wrote extensively about shot placement, behind the shoulder or in the shoulder, which just really surprised me. After all these years, we're still talking about this. He favored behind the shoulder, and he was shooting a rapidly expanding bullet. He favored a hollow point, or he mentioned it in here, but he's also written extensively about using the Nosler partition. Okay, so with the partition, he had a bullet to perform. I don't care where you hit the animal, you're getting penetration, and I don't care what velocity you hit the animal, you know, you're going to get expansion. Plus, the bullet's not going to completely disintegrate. You throw in all the other bullets we're using, you could run into all sorts of issues. Okay, that, that's what the 270 in. And the reason I wanted to get into all that is because we can learn from this with other cartridges, too. Other cartridges are not immune to these problems. I shot a deer on the power line one time with 30 out 6 shot it behind the shoulder, and the deer took off. And I'm sitting there and I'm feeling good. Okay, I, I got a deer, because I knew it was a good shot and I knew the deer wasn't going for it. I'm sitting there, yeah, I got a deer on the ground up there. A few minutes later, another deer steps out in the exact same spot. Another buck, same spot. All right, put it on him, squeezed the trigger. He hit the ground and dropped in his tracks. 
All right, I'm really feeling good at this point. I got two deer on the ground up there. That's a good morning. My buddy Joey was with me that morning. He was further down the power line watching me shoot both of them. He walked up and we went up there and I'm thinking, okay, we'll go ahead and check this one out and then I'll go find that other one. He's right over here in the bushes. I looked at the deer. He had two holes in him. An inch apart, literally. Two, two entrance wounds, two exit wounds, an inch apart. It was the same deer. He, I shot him behind the shoulder, the bullet went clean through. I got very little expansion, very little transfer of energy. The deer ran around. He crossed the power line in a low spot where I couldn't see him, came back around and walked out in the exact same spot to see what that was. <laughs> I sold that rifle two weeks later. <laughs> I was mad. <laughs> I wasn't on in a deer rifle that I was going to shoot the deer and they were going to come back to see what that was. <laughs> that was with the 30 out 6. Imagine if that had been with the 270 and imagine if that had been with a bullet where I just completely penciled the deer. All right, with that 30 out 6, I'm sure I would have found the deer. He, I might have been tracking him a long time, but I would have found him eventually. I had a decent size exit one, but it, I mean, that's deer hunting. All right, I didn't get much expansion. I shot behind the shoulder, soft tissue. That particular bullet was a tough one. If I'd shot him in the shoulder, he'd have dropped there. Okay, that's where you need to understand your bullet. You need to understand the cartridge you're using. You need to understand how it's going to perform, and a lot of this stuff we just learn with experience. I said that ballisticstudies.com, that that was the first time I ever read what actually matched my own observations of the 270 and other cartridges. Well, that's not entirely true. The things Jack O'Connor wrote also match my observations. It's just a lot of people made a lot of bad decisions in between his writings and ballisticstudies.com. Basically, some people that started messing with things out and I've been messing with them, they messed up the 270. <laughs> and they messed up a lot of other cartridges too. But here, here's the thing. When we talk about 270, and we might as well just go ahead and say it, well, it's always compared to the 30 out 6. You can't say 270 without talking about 30 out 6. These two cartridges aren't meant to compete against each other. They're meant to complement each other and just they get both of them together, they give you that many more choices. And the 30 out 6, it does what it does with just brute force. And there's something to be said for brute force because it gets the job done. The 270 is a more sophisticated cartridge. I say sophisticated, complex. It's kind of like a, a lever and a fulcrum. All right, you, you can move a heavy stone just, you know, putting your back into it, but if you break out a lever and a fulcrum, okay, it's easier to move it. That's what lets the 270 keep up with the larger cartridges as far as game and so forth. But there's more that can go wrong with the 270 because no matter what, it's going to be a smaller bullet. It's the bottom line, a lever and a fulcrum. You know, your lever can still break. But the 270 has its place. All right. it, it, it does give you more range. It is flatter shooting. You can get the 270 chambered in a lighter rifle. The, this featherweight here, the, the favorite of Jack O'Connor. I would not want this rifle chambered in 30 out 6. This is not a bad rifle to shoot in 270. It's a comfortable rifle in 270. But this same rifle in 30 out 6 would, would start to be getting uncomfortable. <laughs> and there's a lot of people out there that don't need the recoil of a 30 out 6. Well, this gives them a, an alternative that can keep up with it. It's just you have to understand what's going on. And yeah, this is complex stuff when we get into all this. And again, the ammo manufacturers blew it up or messed it up. And you would think they would know what they were doing. They're the experts, supposedly. 
we could debate that. But anyway, if you need the lighter of recoil of the 270, if you wanted it, you know, something that's still going to get the job done in a lighter rifle, that's the purpose of the 270. And it all comes down to shot placement. Okay, all I said about shooting behind the shoulder and in the shoulder, well, if you can't pick your spot and hit it, it don't really matter, does it? <laughs> a lot of people are going to put the 270 where they need to put it. They can't put the 30 out 6 where they need to because of the recoil. All right. you know, it, the 270 has its place, and it is a wonderful cartridge. And it's more versatile than we give it credit for. And I, keep this in mind, too. The, the 270, you do run into complexity with it that you don't have with the 30 out 6. All right. Winchester got it right to start with, though. They offered it in one bullet. You couldn't mess that up. <laughs> so when people started changing things. <laughs> so the original designers in 1925, they nailed it, and Jack O'Connor had it right to praise it. <laughs> but us having options now, the 270 isn't offered in many bullet weights. But it's still more versatile than we even think about. But once you understand cartridges, bullet performance, and so on, you can make this do some wonderful things. The, the featherweight I set up. I downloaded the 270. I set this up to be a woods gun. Right, the 270 is not a woods cartridge. It was never designed to be that. I set this up to be a woods gun, so I downloaded this cartridge. I put a 140 grain bullet in it, a boat tail soft point, so I loaded a very soft bullet in this. Well, that boat tail soft point wasn't meant to be a woods bullet either. It was not made for impacts at close ranges at high velocities. It's going to go to pieces. It's a soft bullet. I slowed it down. So now my impacts with the 140 grain bullet in the load that I came up with for this rifle I'm going to get impact velocities at exactly what Hornaday intended for those impact velocities to be. The bullet should perform flawlessly. And essentially, I turned this 270 into a 7 millimeter 08. The, and Jack O'Connor himself, he's basically said the 270 and the 280 were almost identical, almost interchangeable. 280 is only seven thousandths of an inch larger in diameter than a 270. 277 diameter, 284 diameter, almost identical. Well, the same way with this and 7 millimeter 08, once I downloaded it, I've got a 140 grain bullet running 2,800 feet per second. 7 millimeter 08 territory. So the, the 270 can do a lot and you can get a lot out of it. You just have to understand it. You have to put a little more thought into it. Once you do that, it is an amazing cartridge, and it does deserve its place among the greatest cartridges ever invented. And for some people, depending on you, the individual, this could be the best hunting cartridge ever for you. So, yeah, it's a great cartridge, and I... I started out as a hater of the 270 and I have become an admirer of it. Well, that was a video I didn't think I'd ever be making. <laughs> but hey, you know, we learn as we go and times change. All right, if you enjoyed this at all, please hit the thumbs up button. Let YouTube know you enjoyed it. It helps out the video, helps out the channel. And if you didn't enjoy it, hit the thumbs up. Let YouTube know you like shooting and hunting videos. If you want to see what we're into next week, just Whatever that is, it's springtime, who knows, and I'm hoping to be fishing, but hit the subscribe button and notification bell. And I really hope this helps some of y'all gain a new appreciation of the 270, and I hope it helps some of y'all that love a 270 understand why there's so many haters out there. All right, both sides of this argument are right, and basically it just back in the 90s, it come down to luck as to what ammo you ended up with. So God bless and have a good day.